um, today we are honored to have my name my subject Today we are honored to have Özlü Rojak from Sabancı University uh, for Quiz AI Talks. Özlü Rojak received her PhD from CMU in 2011. And since 2018, she has been working with Sabancı University and prior to that she was at Bacon and then she did her postdoc at MSR Cambridge in the US. She is working on diverse problems in machine learning for computational biology. She's also a recipient of multiple prestigious awards such as Bagat and UNESCO Real National Fellowship for Young Women in Life Sciences and Metro Mustafa Farda Foundation Research Incentive Award. We are looking forward to her talk titled Machine Learning for Life Sciences. Thank you very much for the nice invite and introduction. It's a pleasure to be here. I have been following you on Twitter and all these exciting seminars. Um, I, I put the, the most broad title to it. <laughs> this is, as you know, like you cannot decide what to present. <laughs> you go with this uh, broad title. So we, oh, why is the line? So um, to, to, like one month ago, uh, the CEO of the MVDI um, had this thought, and on Twitter, at least on my sphere on Twitter, this is very big. Um, Think uh, so. Very well, I think the next amazing revolution is going to come, and this is going to be flat out one of the biggest ones ever. There is no question that digital biology is going to be. Big. So we have been calling the computational biology, bioinformatics, all different um, or data science for biology. We have a new term now, but um, th there has been. I mean, the fact that these big companies are now focusing on. Um, this area is not a coincidence. Like the vision and the natural language processing fields, we have our field of data, and biology is actually really rich in data. Not only types of data, but the structure of the data is also rich, which makes it amenable to interesting machine learning problems to solve it through machine learning. So we have, for example, structural data, which you might know through the upper fold, uh, through the 3D structure of the proteins or the structure of the drugs other compounds. We have omics data, which is vast. I mean, we can now measure the, we can sequence the genomes. We can uh, measure the epigenetic events on the genomes. We can look at the levels of molecules, like the abundance of the genes, uh, gene expression levels, abundance of the protein expression levels. Uh, we can also look at like metabolic data and so on. We have also other data, like functional data on proteins, cells and also their interaction systems. So all this rich on this rich data in my group they have been working on different sets of problems uh, from cancer to uh, just uh, molecular prediction of proteins and, and the association of the properties and so on. Today I'm going to be focusing on uh, two specific projects and the first one is going to be about um, drug synergy prediction. Instead of uh, one of the focus areas of the machine, the technology synergies is also uh, very lucrative business uh, from the students and the machine learning resources and allowing it to um, make that prediction pipeline more efficient. So this is one problem in this in the big drug um, drug design process. So and this is a collaboration uh, with my co-advisor Halim Brian Crew and he's an uh, ethnic and PhD student and my colleague and friend Arjun Chip. So I'm going to be talking about two parts in this project. The first part is the drug synergy prediction on cell lines and the second part is how to personalize these drug synergy predictions. So um, we call two pairs of drugs are synergistic when their uh, therapeutic effect exceeds the exceeds their additive effect. So this could be through different mechanisms. For example, they might be acting on the same pathway on different steps, so they are, they are having a stronger um, a, a end result, or they might be also altering the pharmacokinetic of another, another drug. For example, uh, levodopa uh, needs to act on the brain, but the enzymes, peripheral enzymes will come and degrade it, so another drug will come and block this degradation so that it can act on the uh, achieve its purpose. So the synergistic scoring in the, in the lab um, is done as follows. Um, let's say you have two drug combination, and you would apply these two drugs on cell lines. Cell lines are these cells that are immortal, it's easy to divide uh, in um, different conditions, and they, they represent the 
uh, different cell types. So we have cell lines for cancer, we have cell lines for brain, and so on. So I see competition by this there. I cannot say I'm not expecting <laughs> So um, the way this, this is measured in the lab is they apply the um, different doses of the drug. So the first row and the first column is just application for administering only one drug. And then um, the, the other uh, entries of this matrix are different concentrations of the drug A and drug B and the end result. The, the, the thing that you might be monitoring could be like if this is a cancer cell, it could be the relative inhibition um, and so on. So, um, and based on this matrix, then uh, based on different um, synergy um, measures, you can actually model and uh, arrive at a score. So if they are not today, you have a synergy score, it could be a least score rules model and so on. They have all different assumptions to, um, to quantify this um, synergy score, but a high score indicates these two drugs are synergies, a low and negative score indicates that they are antagonistic, that they are not working together, but they are um, in reverse, uh, they are, they, they are uh, completely cheap at each other. So experimentally, um, so there are high throughput screenings. So you can actually have like hundreds of cell lines, have drug pairs, and then uh, put them, uh, assay them like automatically um, uh, for uh, thousands of them. So this is for, from a uh, recent paper from Nature 2012. Um, this is one of the largest data sets, GPS combo data sets. So they have drug A, B, and cell line, we call these triplets. And even in this very large scale study, they were able to look at like 125 cancer cell lines and 2,025 drug combinations. And of these, they were only able to experimentally measure 20% of all possible triplets that can be screened. Um, so the, the reason is because the, com the drug combination space is less. Like even if you have like 100 drugs, 100 uh, drugs multiplied by 100 drugs, that's going to be 10,000. If you have 100 cell lines, that will be million immediately. And then you need to measure this for different drug uh, responses, doses, and so on. So doing this experimentally is not a is not feasible. So this is actually a computation problem. It is prioritizing uh, what to screen is a computation problem. So people have been working on this. This is an old problem, uh, synergy prediction on cell lines. We have also, uh, we introduced our model um, matchmaker. This, uh, when it was published, actually relies on the largest data available. Uh, how it works is it's, a, it's actually a very simple architecture. Um, we have the drug structures. Uh, these are actually encoded by some fingerprints. So there are libraries that you put input the structure and they will give you, they will count different types of bones, rings, and so on, and describe the structure in uh, hundreds of features. And uh, so these, the, 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 the form of our data is like, we have a drug pair, and this is measured on a specific cell line. Let's say specific cancer cell line, and we have the synergy measurement for that specific cell line. The same drug could be measured on many different cell lines as well. So to describe the cell line, we encode the uh, we encode the cell line with the gene expression measured on the cell line. But this we, we get a subset of, of, of the genes and so on. So what we do is we have two um, sub networks here. One of them conditions. The, the, the representation of the drug on the cell line expression data and learns a um, drug representation. The second one also does the same for the other drug. And at the end of the day, they are competent and then fed into a synergy prediction module and it that makes a um, we, we predict the synergy score. So this is a regression problem. The synergy scores are continuous and the, the, the drug structures are represented with chemical descriptors, like the chemical library. And the untreated expression profiles of these cell lines are represented by landmark genes. These landmark genes are as, uh, about a thousand genes, which you can reconstruct the other gene expression of. So, kind of um, um, genes whose expression levels are informative of all what's going on in the, on, in the cell. So, we used uh, this. Uh, drug from data set at the time there were about 280,000 triplets, a drug pair in a cell line, which contained about 3,000 drugs and 81 cell lines. And um, it's a regression problem. We had a mean squared error loss, but we weighted the uh, mean squared error uh, proportion to the synergy score. We wanted the model to focus on 
more on the synergistic ones because those are the uh, things that we care about. We don't want more of more, more mistake on those. But how how yeah. is the distribution like? Um, actually, in I think I don't have it here, but in the um, in the paper we have that. So it's like uh, it's centered around zero. It peaks at zero. It's like a normal distribution. We have more antagonistic scores. Um, you have a little bit less synergistic scores, but it goes to like minus 20 to 20, uh, centered around zero. So it is in normal system. Uh, it is a little bit imbalanced, but the reason that we use this weighted loss is because we care about the, we don't want to make so much mistake on the synergistic ones. Like these are the important ones because at the end of the day, we want to predict the pairs that are synergistic. So, can uh, you have a good baselines with binary like threshold and then doing either positive or negative? Uh, so, um, I didn't include this here, but what we did is uh, not in the training, but after the postdoc analysis. Uh, we finalize that and then evaluate the classification kind of us. Is it worse? Uh, yeah, if you don't use the weighted MSA, it's worse. So, and then you do that like the AUC is around 0 0.97, but depending on, depends on how you do that finalization. If you do like, I'm going to call things that are uh, below minus 10 antagonistic and above 10 synergistic, that's going to be an easy problem because it's easy to separate. But if you make this a little bit uh, close to each other, then it becomes a more difficult mess. So we, we, um, I think I moved that classification back on us in here, but I included the regression uh, back on us. So here we compare um, our results. The matchmaker is the one that we have with deep synergy. That was the only model that um, that was based on deep learning and was also using the same uh, data set. Uh, Tree combo is a gradient uh, boosted precision tree based algorithm. We train random forest and elastic net ourselves and the baseline uh, model, which is just the mean of the uh, training data. Um, so we have three metrics here mean squared error, Pearson correlation, and Spearman correlation. So in all of these metrics, which may actually perform well. Um, and we also looked at several cases like of the 81 cell lines. Um, of 75 of the 81 cell lines, the Pearson correlation coefficient was about 0.7. So that's not the case that we are doing well on few cell lines and then the rest is not good. Uh, for the drug payers, it was a little bit um, more lower. Like we have 26% of the drug payers where the Pearson correlation is about 0.7. If you don't have enough examples for a drug in the, in the training data, then it becomes more difficult, of course. Um, here we do a drug payer um, reward strategy. So if we see a drug payer in the training data, um, remember our examples are triplets. So drug payer plus the cell line. So if we see the drug payer in the um, training data, the test data will not include any drug or example that will include that drug. So if you do things randomly, it might be zero to any of the two or the pair. The pair. So any of the two is a very difficult problem. All the models back on us get very, very low. So if you don't see that drug at all in the training, it becomes hard. I mean, it, 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 the performance is get lower for all models. It's very good. <laughs> yeah. So um, we also checked if we were to remove the gene expression data and just rely on the structure, um, what would be the um, prediction performance? And there is a 25 percent decrease in, in the correlation effects. So we also looked at um, this consistent false positives, meaning that we, um, we got 10 randomly initialized measurement models and then took the, those um, predictions where the model thinks that they are synergistic, but the label says otherwise. We were using the low mean uh, scenario score. And then we think in all of these 10 models, the model is insisting that it's synergistic. We substitute them. There are 25 um, cases like that. So then we went back and checked for the existing is existence of other synergy um, metrics. So CSS, SD, place, and HSI, these are different metrics. Um, and we actually, when we went back to the data, we realized that we are predicting them as synergistic. And this is the last column summarizing the support of these other metrics. So in the first one, for example, all of them are actually already told that these are synergistic pairs. 
but the low risk score was uh, the noisy one. So the, the model was actually able to catch that. Uh, the, the label was actually uh, not correct and predict the uh, uh, make correct prediction. So, uh, but this also points to the fact that there is quite an uncertainty on the label as well. So, um, the, 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 the labels, uh, these numbers that we get depends on those response matrix, how large that is, uh, those response matrix, because the more, the more reliable you will have. So, recently we start um, collaborating with the University of Manchester uh, with a group that focuses on, on uncertainty. What they do is um, they have a model for Simba. They take this those response matrix and based on the numbers on that, based on a um, on a model, a probabilistic model, based on a probabilistic model, they quantify the uncertainty of the label that you get out of or out of this drug response matrix. So with the uncertainty estimations, I think we do better. So this was um, this was the predictions on the cell line. So cell lines are are. Uh, this is good. I mean, we have large scale measurements of cell line data, but cell lines are only a proxy in character as in the biological context of what is going on actually in the human body, right? So it doesn't also, when you work with cancer, it won't capture the patient's heterogeneity. And every tumor is different from every patient. So the, the question, the big question is like, how can we personalize that scenario prediction? So if a patient comes, you have the tumor. How can you suggest a new drug payer uh, that's going to work synergistically for this uh, patient? So um, the, the the first hopeful thought was like, we are going to look at this the literature and now find uh, a data set of patients, like the measurements of gene expression levels and the synergy scores. So we will be able to just directly train or fine tune our model to work with this synergy measurements. But that's not the case because I mean there are experiments. People have been doing these experiments, but the data is um, profitable. So most of the time, the, the data is not released. So even when they are conducted in research groups, they do not actually release this um, uh, data. And also the pharmaceuticals also have the data. But we found one paper. This paper from 2018 is a um, is has collected leukemia uh, patient data. Um, and they have a um, single drug sensitive score, meaning that you apply one drug and see how good it is working for this uh, patient. And they have also been synergy scores, but the synergy scores that they have is only training. So the whole data we have is training triplets, so training drug per patient population. So there's no way that you can train to the model and not any machine learning model for this. So, um, but we have some. Drug, single drug sensitive scores here, which are um, not synergy scores, but only the how the, the patient responds to this single drug. So um, the summary of the data situation is as follows. So we have this huge, uh, like by the time you get to work on this problem, the data is updated. Now we have about 303,000 triplets, which include this many drugs and uh, cell lines. So, this data is huge. The, the drug payer synergy measurement on cell lines, we have a lot of them. Um, but for the single drug response data for patients, we have only like hundreds, like 654 single drug. Drug payer synergy data for patients, that's tiny. So, how can we make the most of, this, uh, of these data that's available? So, what we find in the first yeah, time, sure. so how did they collect that data? So did they give the drugs to the same patients? No, no. They, uh, they take the tumor and then they implant it on an organ or something like that. And then they extract RNA, they apply the drug, extract the RNA, and so on. So they take the ex vivo. Yeah, that's called ex vivo. Yeah, it's not ethical like ex vivo. Yeah, that's but, but that's another thing. But, but, but I mean, of course, it's not like that. Mm -hmm. No, no, that means it's going to be so on, on human, on humans. But actually what happens for cancer patients is like the patient, the, the doctors has to try different drug, drugs, drugs, yeah, things are hopeless. So what they can happen is like they are actually experiments. So, but uh, these data is like um, tumors extracted and then uh, drugs are uh, enhanced on that. So there is actually an excited field and 
he actually established a new collaboration with um, a Monsignor University and then the Tukorno uh, University. That's why we couldn't get the data yet because of this move. But um, this, uh, um, they have this organoids where they have um, the, the implanted tumor data and then they grow it so that but now it's not just a cell line from like a 20 years or 50 years ago collected and then has been divided since then, but it's actually the actual patient data which represents that very specific patient. They have measurements of drugs, um, single drug response data, which we are really excited to collaborate on, but things have been slow. So, um, okay, how are we going to make the most of this data? So, we train on this um, data. We have, uh, and then we are going to fine tune for patients using this one. And then we can only evaluate using these 20 examples. 20, I know for vision researchers and other researchers, this is like, I'm like joking, but that's the case in uh, biology medicine. We, if you have 20 data points, uh, you might be happy. So, um, but one problem is that, um, okay, we are going to train on this data, but in our matchmaker model, um, we are only doing synergy prediction, right? So we don't, the data that we are going to fine tune on is on single drug response data. It's not synergy. So we need to add something into this model that will allow us to fine tune the model uh, with the single response data. So we go back to the database and get also, uh, yeah, so we do not predict the single drug response prediction match paper. Um, so but we want to fine tune with this data. So what we do is we added two more health search, uh, sensitivity for drug A and sensitivity for drug B. So now this is a multitask objective. We want to uh, predict uh, synergy at the same time, the sensitivity of the drug A and drug B. What we are going to do is uh, we will use both drug pair synergy data and now single drug response data on cell lines. Um, to train this model. This is going to be our pre trained model, foundation model. And then um, we are going to fine tune for patients. And we have two strategies uh, to fine tune for the patient. In the first one, we freeze the, I'm sorry, uh, we freeze the, so we, we train the model and then we freeze the, um, sorry, in the first one, we fine tune with the data from all patients. So I have three patients, I'm going to use all of the data uh, for that. So all patient data is used for fine tuning. So we, we train the model and then freeze the synergy um, prediction model and uh, make prediction fine tune based on these single drug response um, objectives. And after that, we use this fine tune model. We, are, we now unfreeze the synergy prediction model. Now the hope is here that while we are doing this, the representation of the earlier layers have been they have adapted themselves to this patient. So we were able to fine tune to make also the, the synergy prediction better. So uh, we fine tune the model for, um, the, so we evaluate the patients with the synergy prediction values. So no synergy prediction depth of the patient goes into the fine tuning process, only the single direct response. And the um, second strategy, we uh, fine tune per patient. So if we are going to make a prediction, for this patient, we make a different fine tuning, only relying on the data of this patient, and I make a prediction for this patient, and we did that for all these three different patients. Okay, so um, the the data, the evolution data is so small that it can fit in the, in the slide. So we have these three measurements uh, of the of these compounds and the patients. So each row is is one example, and what you see here uh, as blue are the uh, true predictions and um, reds are the are, are the incorrect predictions. What happens is so these are the uh, models that we compare. So this is random forest three compound leaf synergy matchmaker without uh, fine tuning. Deep TDS is also another method. TDSP is the uh, is our model but uh, without fine tuning, just the single response prediction has are added. So um, Models with no fine tuning, they actually yield a large number of false positives and small true negatives. Almost they, they almost always predict as uh, 
positive synergies, they don't predict our figures. Like, for example, look at this random forest. All predictions are positive. Of course, like in this data, half of them are uh, synergistic, half of them are antibiotic. Uh, the, 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 the paper has selected these um, in, in so the, the end, at the end of the day, 10 of them they found synergistic and 10 of them as non synergistic and antibiotic. But like random forest will treat everything as uh, synergistic. And this is also true for most of these models. When we have fine tune uh, with the patients, um, it becomes better. So, especially when you fine tune per patient, the, the performance. So this um, the summary of this project is like although we have very large data drug combination on synergy regions on cell lines, um, patient data is not readily available. So um, it's not uh, we need like to to uh, fine tune on the on the patients for the patients you need different strategies if you need to take a uh, situation. But as the as the data get uh, I mean, right now, this is kind of um, the start of the project, right? because we have only three examples to emulate. So as we get more data, I think this is going to get more interesting. And we can also incorporate other patient genomic data. Right now, we are only characterizing the patient with the gene expression levels. But if we have the mutation data, microscopy uh, structures, copy number variations, like other events going on in the genome, the, the model that can get richer and incorporating uncertain estimations in the framework uh, could be interesting. So as, as we do this work, the field is advancing, like now we have better drug representations, especially like deep uh representations of the drug structures. We still didn't get to heavily cover all the work in this uh, specific context. Uh, so, do I have time? I have. I was planning to talk about the second uh, subject, but if I don't, I don't want to talk about it. Oh, yeah, 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 uh, yeah. Uh, if you have questions in the first part. Uh, so, yeah. as for example, mm -hmm. uh, like uh, cell lines are collected for different organs for different mm -hmm. tissues. Yeah. So, my question is mm -hmm. so, how do the like drugs? Work on the different tissues of cancer. Yeah, so the, the data is actually like that. So the what we have are the triplets. So this drug here, this cell line, one is the major. Huh. So it's not like we are we are only putting the drug there and then making the universal prediction for all cell types, but we are making the prediction for that specific cell type. So when I say cell line, they, they are actually represented for different cell types. And what about the patients? So or they have the same type? So three ah, patients, so three in, different in this case, in this case, actually, um, it is it is not a specific cell type, I think. And I think this is a good question. I think one uh, further step that will make this in taking into account single cell measuring this, like so but and then account for the different cell types of the patients tumor. In this case it's not single cell measurement. So it's like getting to a machine gap and then measuring gene expression. So it's an average of what's going on uh, in these different cell types. But now there's technology on how uh, measure different or measure the expression levels on the single cell level, which is going to I think um, have solved this problem that, that will account for the cell types because when you have a single uh, cell gene expression, you can actually analyze the different cell types. Uh, I still have. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, I have, I have some kind of like, uh, mm -hmm. also few things. Mm -hmm. So these patients should have one cancer, for example. Uh, this one, three yeah, patients. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah, these are the same as yeah. yeah. And uh, for example, let's say that they have the breast cancer, mm -hmm. and you have the predictions for different cell types. But this, for example, is it possible to obtain better support if uh, you like uh, know the data for the breast cancer cell? Ah, I see. So, yeah, that could that that was um that's a good question. So right now, because the data is large, we are kind of leveraging all of them. But there could be maybe a second fine tuning process, like fine tuning on the breast cancer cell line data, and then move to patients and make it closer, or maybe uh, bait those examples, or maybe as you suggest, just slowly train on that and see how it's going to be. 
It's always the limited student time. They should be very embarrassed. Yeah, I think so too. Yeah. Is there no way to simulate this process and create some synthetic data? No. I'm not going to do it. I think maybe in future with these generative models, it might be possible and it would be nice. Second question. Is there work to, like, there are some adaptive things with the Marshall learning and rate learning, which can adapt to one sample at a time and just the base of the network by specializing to the sample that it sees and so on? I haven't seen any work, uh, but usually um, your field is progressing much faster than our field. We get inspiration from that. This is very interesting. I would like to love to talk about that because I think that's, that seems very relevant. Um, because the patient is kind of exactly, you can zero shock adjusts, but you can yeah, so the probably someone's going to do uh, no, 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 I don't think so yet. No. So, um, okay, so if we have time, I'll also mention totally different projects <laughs> to, um, to mention one more. But to just kind of give a glimpse of like um, these different set, types of projects going on in computational biology. So, this is inspired by this. Um, Paper they just said cartography. I think you you also know this, and you have a recent uh, yes. paper that's related to this. Right? Yeah. That's why actually I only want to put this. So when I read this paper, I found it really interesting. And then um, so this, the paper is about like using the training dynamics, like what's going on in the um, probable, the, how the model uh, predicts the ground truth label across the apples, and I'm making use of that to classify the examples as like hard to learn, easy to learn, ambiguous, and so on. Um, so we, we use this technique for something else. So the, um, to going back to the high school biology, you know that we have our DNA, and then from this DNA, um, we have the mRNA translated and transcribed, and then the uh, protein is um, produced from this segment. So this is called, this is the coding strand of this DNA. We have the uh, this is uh, translated into mRNA, and then we have um, this is called open reading frame. So it starts with the start codon, it ends with the stop codon. Eventually, um, a protein is produced from this mRNA. But our high school biology, since my high school, maybe for the students is not the case, but has been updated uh, with the transcriptomics ex experiments quite, uh, quite uh, drastically. Um, now, the coding. Um, mRNAs are actually a very tiny fraction of all the RNAs that we have in our genomes. We have a large uh, transcriptome for non-coding RNAs. And um, long non-coding RNAs is one subset on this non-coding RNA, uh, RNAs, and it's kind of very arbitrarily classified. The criteria to call something a long non-coding RNA is that they are uh, non-coding RNAs which are longer than 200. And the reason is because, like traditionally, an open reading frame, and uh, this this that the code for a protein is considered as like um, 100 amino acids in eukaryotes and 50 amino acids in bacteria. So, very arbitrary definition of non coding non coding RNA just based on the length of the um, length of non coding RNA. But recently, there has been papers, um, few papers though, not too many that are uh, reporting some, um, these long non coding RNAs might have regions inside them that might be coding for very small proteins or micropeptides, which might have missed this annotation equation. So like um, a micropeptide encoding by a protective long non coding RNA regulates muscle patterns. And they have very interesting functions as well. Uh, so um, there are actually uh, techniques for discovering Coding, uh, coding RNAs, like which of these RNAs are codings, and for example, ribosome profiling is one of the most sophisticated ones. It will capture the um, sequences that is going through the ribosome, and then sequences, and then from there actually get what is actually going into the ribosome machinery to uh, to produce the protein. But these are um, expensive experiments, and also uh, you have to take cell type dependent. My mass spectrometry is another experiment, it's not very sensitive and so on. 
So we, we decided that maybe we could uh, use this uh, technique to find these misannotated long non coding variants. So what we do is as follows. So we, we collect the data set of coding uh, RNAs and non coding RNA sequences. Um, so we uh, use a um, language model that's trained on the um, RNAs, uh, on the DNA sequence to encode these as embeddings. So we have streamer embeddings. Then we are going to now classify, we, we built some classifiers to uh, classify coding and non coding RNAs. So uh, we have the uh, coding RNAs, non coding RNA sequences, their representation as embeddings associated ground truth labels. And we, we train deep learning models. So we did try different architectures like based on CNN, um, LSTM, and also Transformer, and so on. Um, so this will, so, and then we looked into the deep learning um, training dynamics as this um, paper that the cartography paper had done. So, first, like the, the success of the classification, we can achieve like 0.96. Uh, classification non coding to, to separate non coding coding uh, sequences. So the models are uh, pretty discriminative. And um, now, the, what does this training dynamic do? What it does is actually we can exemplify this with these uh, five um, examples, I think. So um, here the blue is showing you the coding um, ground truth tables. And when something is orange, that's a transcript or RNA sequence that's non-coding. And on the y-axis, we have the uh, coding probability. Um, if we look at like A, so this is a coding um, sequence and the coding probability is one. So that's actually throughout, starting even from the, the, the second effort, the model predicts this correctly as coding. There are also uh, this, this non coding one, the coding probability is 0 to E. So that's also doing a good job. With C and D, there is some ambiguity, but there is B here, which is actually labeled as non coding, but the model ins insists that this is a coding, uh, the coding probability is high all across all efforts. So actually, then we went back and checked this transcript in 2020, someone has already classified this as a coding uh, protein. So these Classifications are continu continuously updated as new research comes up, but by the data that we have is prior to that, um, that uh, classification. So, so the model actually can figure out that uh, this is actually misannotated. So what we do is, oops, sorry, what we do is, like the paper did, we look at the standard deviation of, so the mean of the predicted true label probability. So. Um, that should be high, right? And then if this is small, if you mean of the predicted true label probability, that's like, that could be, those could be the promising misannotated uh, non coding RNAs. And also we look at the standard deviation of the predicted true label probability. So we want that across all the folks, I mean, almost across all the folks, this should be, uh, the probability should be small. So the V1 is hard to learn region. Um, we did also some experiments, like if we were to take examples from this region and fill it their labels, would the model be able to capture them and so on? And it, it can actually do. So that's like a simulation experiment. Um, then, so this, the first subfigure here shows you the different models and their agreement. So there's um, a set here that everyone agrees on, but we use the union of them uh, as the potential uh, misannotated interrogates. Later, we also augment this list with other information. What we did was to compare them against um, some um, coding binary databases and we find overlap um, with different methods and then different uh, databases as well. This is a TSNI uh, plot showing the, the uh, embeddings of the yeah, so these are different models doing the same thing, right? Yes, yes, yes. 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 so there are. In uncertainty quantification, they run the same model, for example, k types, they only travel initializations and mm -hmm. so on, and then they check the distribution across these five random initializations. Mm -hmm. Here, I think this is the as final the difference. Model. Has anyone tried? Maybe. It's very really expensive, them. by the way, but I've seen people using, for example, 100 less than 50. So mm -hmm. The R is not as big as yours, so it might not be that expensive for us. Okay. So, 
In this case, the difference is you basically uh, like follow the predictions of the model to different predictions of the box. Mm -hmm. So that's not the final uh, prediction. Uh, that's why yeah, it's called the third time. That's the difference. But I think exactly the same. Maybe I misunderstood. Since you said your answer is not for the quantification, it's just interesting to say. I don't know. So I'm not just saying it's not for So, um, we, we actually checked the maybe we yeah, are we check what she knows about it, but that's fine. Okay, so um this is actually uh, showing the different types of um RNAs like embedded in a distant part. Um the pluses are the possible misannotating all non coding RNAs. So the coding ones are the blue ones. So it's interesting that they land on um in a just in a continuous cluster with the coding ones. So, um, blue, blue is the coding one. The pluses are the um, pluses are the possible misannotating RNAs, and they actually are very close by to the coding ones. Decision making, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, um, I'm not going to go into every detail of this one, but we. Um, get this list and now we edit other uh, biological information like one of them is for example you can get a sequence and then um, search it against all available protein sequences and then see if there is a protein sequence that's similar to that sequence blast <laughs> so we blasted them and then check if there exist any protein sequences that are similar to these possible coding sequences so here, for example, you see the top plus hits uh, here. These other ones are um, like if there is a ribosec experiment reporting this transcript in an experiment. Um, and the, these other CNC CPCs, in fact, these are a coding potential tools. So they work with other things like they use evolutionary conservation and so on. For example, this one is especially interesting. Like all of our models are saying that it has a high coding probability, but none of these models are actually thinking that as a coding uh, potential. So, but we when we look for it, we find a uh, uh, protein sequence that's similar to. It. Also, on a subset of the proteins, we put these sequences into. Um, I might put that. We put them into AlphaFold and checked whether they will fold into meaningful uh, protein structures. So uh, these are um, helical structures, like stable helical structures, and there is actually. Um, like I was curious, like why they are all helices? Like it, it's always comes helices, and there is actually one paper reporting that microproteins are usually folds into helices, structure because it's more stable. And there are like these interesting papers, like there is helical bundles, this microprotein will go and bind in between them, and then they will make a the function of the cell and so on. Yeah, so this paper is published in Bioinformatics. You can have an access to that. Um, so summary of this part, it's possible maybe to identify some of uh, these protected misannotated link RNAs. Uh, it will be interesting to actually talk on this work with an experimental work to see that truly that any of them could be uh, are actually getting into a protein structure of, uh, and so on. But um, this is actually another work that offers promising potential for assisting experimental efforts in characterizing this hidden and the functions related to these ones. So, in summary, going back to my very first slide, biology is rich in data. It's very interesting problems, I think, <laughs> in my biased opinion. And we want more machine learning researchers to focus on this area so that we can change the, uh, not only, we can not only push the boundaries of life sciences, but also affect the patients because everything we know about the cell could have the potential to also have an effect on diseases and uh, curing um, patients. So um, I want to take thank to my collaborators and supporters. And if you have any questions, I would be happy to ask. Thank you for your time. Any other government questions for anyone to talk? I don't know if any other, if there are any other questions on Zoom as well, we have time. Perfect time. <laughs> <laughs>
So in Turkey, are there any institutions uh, to make some recommendations? Yeah, I mean, this usually works with having good collaborators. It is very difficult because, I mean, you have to get, I mean, the person needs to really get interested. And as that, there needs resources and money. Unless you write the project together, I can say it's a which I haven't been very good at, but I'm now chasing after my like, external environment so that they can get into it and so on. And what about the situation in the UK? So, uh, like, are yeah. the researchers not now some public data? No, there are now uh, the giant design work that's more about these big consortiums. So, you would have papers with like about 300 people MIT collaborate with so Texas, UCSF. So, like, they, they have like five year old one projects, each of them will do another set, but that would be a big chunk of work. And then they have meetings organized, so and at the end of the day, they're really published in nature, so like, uh, by their need. Um, so that those consortiums are, I, I think, maybe it's way to go. Any questions? Thank you, John. Thank you so much. <laughs>